This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. Learn fertility awareness from the comfort of your own home at your own pace for a fraction of the cost. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 385. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Today's episode focuses on men's health and more specifically how nutrition relates to sperm health and testosterone production. And so in today's episode, I'm interviewing Joe Whitaker. He is a clinical nutritionist and researcher. He holds a master's degree in nutritional therapy from the University of Worcester. His research has been published in top academic journals and widely covered by the media. His academic research is focused on men's health, particularly testosterone and sperm health. And he also runs a private clinic in the UK and has helped a variety of clients improve their health and well-being. So without further ado, let's jump into my episode with Joe Whitaker. So I'm really excited to be here today with Joe Whitaker. I invited him on the show after hearing him on a recent episode of the Carnivore MD podcast. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about testosterone and what men can do to support their testosterone and of course, therefore support their sperm health. So welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having me on. I'm assuming uh, maybe you're somewhat interested in, in the carnivore diet. Uh, since since you saw me on that podcast. I listen to a variety of, I suppose, and expose myself to a variety of information. So I wouldn't say that I'm specifically, like I'm not, I, I'm not a carnivore diet person, but I do follow the carnivore MD because I think some of the things that he shares is interesting. So I typically, one, one of the things I often say on the podcast is I don't really follow a specific diet per se, because really a lot of what I talk about with my listeners is, how to optimize their menstrual cycle. And you know, everyone's a little bit different. But what I talk about a lot is incorporating organ meats for the nutritional content and how that can really be beneficial for fertility. So that's one of the reasons why I think he's on my radar. Yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe it points you more in that direction than the kind of, I mean, because you get get different camps in nutrition, like you get the carnivore, paleo, keto guys on one side, you get the vegans, vegetarians kind of on the other side. So organ meats for fertility, like in the classic Western A. Price study, you know, he he obviously found that indigenous cultures, more traditional cultures, they really, really emphasized using organ meats in um you know for, for fertility basically. Mm-hmm. When I've interviewed Sally Fallon Morell a couple of times to talk a little bit about just that perspective. Let's start a little bit. I couldn't get the full text of the recent study because it was so recent, (laughs) but you were a co-author of a study, Low-Fat Diets and Testosterone in Men, and you did uh, a meta-analysis of some studies. So I'd love to start there just to get a sense of who you are for the audience and why the focus, what is your background and kind of what has led you to focus on this area of study? My background is... Uh, so I'm a nutritionist at the minute, and um, 
I do a lot of research though. That's almost my predominant focus at the minute. And the, the interest in men's health started during my degree, during my master's degree. So I did a master's in nutritional therapy at, at university of Worcester and by, basically everybody, uh, who studies nutrition in the UK is a woman. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just like men's health therefore gets neglected. Although it is interesting when you, when you read the science, there's a lot of men's health, but I mean, in terms of practice anyway, it's my, it's mostly a revolving on women's health. So in, in uni, I got interested in men's health and, uh, I just kind of continued that interest afterwards. And, you know, because it's an understudied topic, there's, there's lots of kind of juicy, ripe academic fruit to pick there. If you want to get your name kind of out there. So, I mean, I can talk about that study if you want. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. And I just wanted to comment that I do think it's interesting what you said that so many of the nutritionists are women. I mean, I never really thought about it, but if I just reflect back, pretty much all of the nutritionists that I'm familiar with or that I've interviewed or that I come across are women. So I'm now I'm really curious to know what the percentage is. So I think that's really interesting because I feel like Often, from my perspective, it seems like the women's aspect of things is understudied. But in your experience, because of the predominance of female nutritionists, it's kind of like some of these aspects are understudied for men. And I think that's really interesting. I think you might be right. I mean, I think in the science, traditionally, there's a lot of research on men's health, probably because traditionally men were scientists, whereas now it's more balanced. In my cohort, it was like everyone was women. Like all the lecturers were in, all the students, there was me and there was one other guy who was, who was doing like a semi-related course. And I remember I asked one woman, I, I was like, don't you th- find it strange that it's all women? And uh, she said, oh, I haven't noticed. I was like, how can you not? <laughs> yeah, no, that's really, that's really interesting. And yeah, that, I'm going to have to have a think on that. I just recently released an episode about... Well, when, by the time this episode is released, it might not be so recent, but there was an episode that I released and it was talking about kind of exercise and how it can affect the menstrual cycle. And in that interview, I made this comment because there's a lot of men out there who are really fit and lean and kind of prominent on social media advocating for intermittent fasting and like all of these different techniques to get fit and lose weight and, you know, get cut. And I made a comment that, you know, when women follow these male influencers, they often like lose their periods and have period problems. And I said, but it doesn't seem to affect men that way. And the woman who I interviewed, uh, Kitty Blomfield, she corrected me and she's like, well, a lot of these men, even though they look really cut, their hormone levels aren't necessarily that great because they may also be under eating and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm not sure if even that's kind of part of what you're getting at with, with your study and saying that kind of men are understudied, but it really made me think like, what's really going on with these men? You know, are they really healthy? Oh, the guys, I mean, when you get to, I mean, like a healthy body fat percentage for a man might be like 10 to 12, like that might be like considered optimal. If you go below that, you, you, your hormones tank and you feel terrible. I've never been below that because it's really, really hard to get there. Like you have to be super dedicated. But essentially, the evolutionary mechanism is if you're not giving your body enough calories, it doesn't promote the functions that promote fertility and reproduction. It shuts those down it, almost in like a hibernation mode and then you know, it kind of waits for better days. So there's been some classic studies in calorie restriction in men, and it shows their testosterone levels like half, which is the same as what you see in mice. And it's one of the reasons why calorie restriction can extend lifespan because your body's essentially kind of like hibernating. So, yeah, that's what's going on with those guys. Well, I mean, I I was just going to say, I have a follow-up question on that because... I don't know. I'm not a guy, you know, and I'm not in men's fitness and health, but I get the impression. So please correct me if I'm wrong. I get the impression that I don't know how much men diet, but I get the impression that women are more likely to diet. But with that said, you know, when men work out and things like that, you know, is it possible that like when you talk about the calorie restriction, like how does this play out in real life for the average guy? Is he dieting or is he working out a lot? I mean, I suppose it could be a combination of both. I mean, typically you'll do 
like guys are trying to gain muscle, they'll do bulking, so they'll eat more. And then when they're trying to lose body fat, they'll cut, so they'll calorie restrict. Yeah, it, it could be the case they're exercising a lot and they're just not eating enough. Particularly sometimes, I do find often with with clients who are men, when they switch to whole food diets, like healthy whole food diet, they struggle to get enough calories because they're eating like chicken breasts and broccoli and stuff that's very satiating but doesn't have a lot of calories. Whereas if you're eating junk food, it's easy to get a lot of calories like McDonald's. It's very calorie dense. But if you switch to the whole foods, you need to, men need to like focus on the, the foods that are calorific, but also not going to irritate the gut, things like that. So you could do, I recommend things like mashed potatoes with like loads of butter, <laughs> stuff like that, or like steaks, or, or you could do like dried fruit, things like that to get your calories up. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because I feel like I often talk about this and think about this, like men and women are different because I think one of the things that I'm trying to share with women who want healthy menstrual cycles is that you can't just follow these, what these people do. Um, you have to look at what your cycles have like doing. If, if you get, if your luteal phase gets really short, if you start getting spotting, if you, if your periods start becoming irregular, or if, if you stop menstruating, you know, you shouldn't be following what these individuals are doing, but the underlying assumption is like, it's working for them. <laughs> but from what you're saying, it might not be actually working for them either, but men don't have a menstrual cycle to tell them like men don't lose a menstrual cycle. Right. So it's not like they can have this, they might feel like that, like they have to kind of pay more attention to how they feel and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I would say it's like for a man, it's difficult to get so low. It's going to, in terms of your body fat, it's so low to, that it's going to impact your reproductive function. But yeah, some of these kind of like Instagram guys, they'd probably like be verging on that. I mean, typically you see it if you guys are in bodybuilding and they're cutting for contests because it takes like a concerted effort to kind of to, to do that. The fasting is interesting. There's not too much research on fasting and testosterone and, and the, I don't think there's any research on fasting and sperm health. But I would generally say it's, pro it's probably not going to harm you in terms of intermittent fasting for men. I mean, you were saying about the difference between men and women. I think there is definitely a difference in intermittent fasting where men seem to be more suited to that compared to women. And, you know, the evolutionary reasons are probably fairly obvious for that. You know, like maybe men had to go for longer periods without food if they're on hunts, whereas women typically doing the gathering roles in hunter-gatherer societies would have, you know, more plentiful access to food and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's dive into, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the study. So I'm just looking at the highlights of the study and I'll put the link in the show notes page for the listeners, for those who are interested, but so I'll just read the highlights because this is interesting. So low fat diets decrease testosterone levels in men, low fat diets appear to decrease testicular testosterone production. And then the effects of low fat diets on testosterone may differ by ethnicity. So interesting conclusions. Yeah, the um, I mean, so it's a meta analysis. So, so basically, you you search the literature of the best studies, and you combine them all, and it gives you an overall answer uh, on the question. And and we found it was fairly consistent that low fat diets decreased men's testosterone. And so something that decreases men's testosterone is generally not good because. Testosterone is a reasonable marker for overall male health and, of course, reproductive health as well. And, yeah, we said it decreased testicular testosterone production. That's kind of like, I don't know, probably a bit boring biochemistry <laughs> for most people. But well, when something is decreasing the raw production of it, it's kind of like even worse because you could just be excreting more, um, which wouldn't be as bad, but you still wouldn't want that. But I mean, I suppose the most interesting aspect of, of the of the research is why. So, so why is a low fat diet seemingly bad for male health? I mean, it, it's a limited number of studies, but definitely points in that direction. And I, I really thought it was the reduction in fat and particularly animal fats, because that's what 
you know, those are the fattier foods typically in a high fat diet is animal fats. And so the reduction in those animal fats seem to have some kind of detrimental effect on men's health. But within those studies, we, we analyzed, there were a couple of these vegetarian low fat diets and they actually showed like a way more of a decrease. So that was about 25%, which is a, <laughs> which is a lot and probably there may be an effect there due an additional effect due to lacking some of the micronutrients that animal animal foods provide so with the low fat diet vegetarian diet you're not only lacking the fat you're also lacking the micronutrients animal foods provide and some key ones involved in testosterone production uh, and definitely sperm health as well um, and sperm quality zinc uh, vitamin A, possibly selenium, although you, you can get quite a lot on plants. But I mean, things like zinc and vitamin A are generally lower in low in uh, vegetarian low fat diets. Uh, so that may be the the reason why why we found that. I mean, in general, like just this morning, I was just having a little kind of like research binge on uh, <laughs> on sperm health and um, those type of topics because obviously I know you're audience is interested in it and I found a study that it showed that men that ate red meat four or more times a week which is like a hell of a lot of red meat especially for the average person they had much better sperm morphology than the men who had low intakes of red meat and because that's an observational study most of the time in observational studies you tend to find meat intake is associated with slightly poorer outcomes some people may say that's because meat's bad for you, but I, I tend to think that that's like healthy user bias because people who eat meat, gen because most people think that's unhealthy, um, people who eat a lot of meat gen generally have other traits that are not very healthy, like they smoke or they drink or exercise. So to find that in an observational study, very high intakes of red meat produce better sperm health you know it's, it's quite a, a strong finding i mean red meat is high in zinc selenium it's high in carnitine all there's like a wealth of research on all of those um, nutrients for supporting male health sperm or testosterone whatever you look at um so so yeah i think within our study i think that those may be the types of reasons why we why we saw those types of effects Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because as you were sharing some of those nutrients, L-carnitine is one of kind of the most well-studied nutrients for sperm health. And so I know a lot of practitioners, we functional practitioners who are working with a couple to improve sperm production, L-carnitine is often one of the kind of key supplements that they're recommended to take. So I think that that's really interesting because I mean, I, my brain always goes to, well, where, where do we find that in food? Not to say that supplements don't have their place because I, I, I do believe that they do, but I think that that's really interesting. So what, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is share with us then a little bit about the relationship between testosterone, sperm, and overall health. When you mentioned, or when I was reading the highlight and it was talking about the sperm production kind of in the testes, it made me, th or the testosterone production in the testes, it made me think directly of sperm production because there is a, I know that there's a very high correlation between a man's testosterone production and his sperm production. Yeah, I can tell you very well read because <laughs> you've got to really dig in, dig into the science to find that. I mean, it took me a while to find that <laughs> when I was, when I was looking for it. I view testosterone as a, as a decent biomarker or barometer um, for overall male health. It's not the be all end all, but generally if your testosterone levels are high, you're in reasonable shape. If they're low, you're probably not in great shape. And you know, it's, it's as a man, it's very difficult to get them too high naturally, of course. Classic roles of testosterone is it's involved in reproductive health, the development of the male reproductive system. But in adulthood, there's a lot of research that shows that lower testosterone levels increase your risk of, of the major chronic diseases. So you're talking things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and e even shortens your lifespan. So something that, that links up with diseases like that, you know, is generally a good biomarker for health. 
And then, yeah, as you rightly pointed out, testosterone is essential for the creation of sperm. It's actually the only hormone, the only steroid hormone that, that's essential for, for making sperm. So in the testes, the, the leadal cells produce testosterone and then you get serotal cells uh, that produce sperm. And on those cells, there are little sites that testosterone binds to and that that and when testosterone binds there, it sends various signals to create sperm and, and then release the mature sperm. So, I mean, on the kind of nitty gritty level, you can see that. But yeah, as you said, if you have high testosterone levels, generally you have a lot better sperm sperm quality. And so you can kind of see it as a triad: uh, male reproductive health with testosterone and sperm, and then overall health. And if if any one of those triad is down, you know the other two are likely to be down. I mean, if you if you look at the research with um, sperm health, the, if you've got low testosterone and borderline low testosterone, you're much more likely to have poor poor sperm health or or possible infertility. I'm curious if you know what normal levels are for men. It's okay. I'm just putting it out there because I don't actually have that handy. But are you, do you know uh, a little bit about kind of the range? For T, it's like, so 300 nanogram per milliliter. I think that's the measurement. I, th- I think that's the unit. That's definitely the measurement. 300, some people say 250. But I mean, in my opinion, the, those reference ranges are like low. I mean, you probably noticed about sperm, how, how the reference range has come down as there's been a, you know, kind of a, totalic decrease in, in sperm counts. Uh, I don't know if the reference range has ever came down, but th- there's been decreases in sperm, sorry, in testosterone, as you know, similar to sperm over the last, well, probably the last 100 years, but certainly since the studies have been running. Oh, that's so, so interesting. I, I, I'd probably say like, um, I don't know, if you're at like 500, that'd be like good. Okay. I think that'll be helpful. I'm sure for at least some of the listeners. So for the listeners who uh, I'll link a bunch of episodes, I'm going to link to this episode, the few episodes that I've done about sperm, but for the listeners for whom this is a new concept. So I'm really interested because I never, I never actually thought about this whole concept of male testosterone levels declining, mostly because I've focused so much on the male sperm issue declining. And so uh, when I was researching for the fit vital sign. And this is something I've talked about the podcast before. And so all, most of my clients have probably heard me say this already. You know, if you look at studies in the forties, just studies on sperm in the forties, the average man um, from some of the studies I was looking at had a sperm concentration of about 113 <laughs> sperm per milliliter, at least the studies I was looking at compared to the average man today, which probably has more like 50 million sperm per milliliter which is a huge drop. I think it's something like 70%. And I feel like this is something that, so what I often say to my clients is it's not your partner. There's nothing wrong with that individual. There's like, everybody is affected by this. All men must be affected by this to some extent. And so what you said, I mean, now I want to <laughs> take the research and see the the testosterone levels, because I'll share with you, I'm, I'm not sure if you, there's a, a, a rat study or a couple of rat studies that I've looked at that were fascinating to me. And basically in these studies, what they did was they gave the male rats and they also did the female rats, but they gave the male rats uh, a vitamin A deficient diet. And what happened was the male rats stopped making sperm and their testosterone levels were basically in the toilet. And then when they put the vitamin A back in the diet, and we're talking retinol, not beta carotene, um, when they put the retinol back in the diet, then the, the rats started to make sperm again and testosterone again. So there was this really interesting on and off switch scenario happening with these animal studies. And also the testosterone production was obviously very well correlated with the sperm production. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, it's like it's fairly well studied in animals. The the link between vitamin A and testosterone is not as well studied in humans, but there are a couple of studies. One was where they gave they gave boys with delayed puberty. They either gave them testosterone, which will induce puberty, or they gave them iron and and retinol, and they found the iron and retinol combination was able to induce puberty as well as testosterone therapy. So that signals it's got a major, major role. 
in uh, Maori reproductive health. On the on the decline in testosterone, is definitely a lot. There's fewer studies than the, the sperm. Like the sperm is so like conclusive. I mean, it's almost like not up for debate anymore. And yeah, I mean, you can go back right to the 30s and see these declines. The testosterone, the data starts in the 70s, but, you know, probably it was going on before, um, you know, as those two things are, are very well correlated, testosterone and sperm. And the, the decrease is about 1% a year. So <laughs> if you take that from 1970, that's 50% decrease. Uh, so it's pretty major. Interestingly, the sperm decrease is a similar rate about 1% a year in, in uh, sperm counts. So, yeah, the, the, I mean, those two are major. I mean, yeah, and for, for individual guys, it's like it's not, it's not your fault that, you know, it's not anybody's fault that you're born into this modern society and you have all of these kind of adverse influences. Like I was reading even today, like mobile phone exposure decreases sperm. And, you know, mobile phone exposure is... Uh, you know, ubiquitous, and then you've got the Wi-Fi as well, the EMFs. So, and then, you know, the other interests like endocrine disruptions, chemicals, things like that. Yeah, so it's definitely not individual's fault. And it's not like you're even, the things you can do, which is a lot, you know, maybe you can't not use a mobile phone for the rest of your life, but you can change your diet, things like that. It's like, you're not taught this in school, so... If you don't know this and you suddenly got a problem when you're 40, yeah, you know, as I say, it's not your fault, but you know, that there obviously are a lot of things you can do to combat it. Well, so I think there's two important questions that I'll kind of launch your way. Because I whenever I talk about these things, if I'm talking about them with a client or in one of my groups or whatever, the the next logical question is usually like why? <laughs> and so you alluded to some of these things, but maybe share just from your perspective what you know, what are some of the reasons why this general decline? Because this is not natural. This is not something that's like to be expected for the male testosterone levels to drop by 50%. And, and then, because the, the concern, which is very obvious, is that if it continues to dramatically decline like this, we will get to a point where men cannot get their partners pregnant. Um, so, you know, question one is kind of like your thoughts on why. And then let's talk about from your perspective as a nutritionist, what men can do to kind of combat this? Yeah, on the why, uh, I mean, I touched on some of them, like the ex- the expo- increased exposure to endo- endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are just chemicals that disrupt your hormonal system, which they're like in everything. It's almost like look around your room, they're in everything you can see, um, all that off-gassing from things. I mean, major sources like plastic, like bottled water, things like that. So that that's one. I mean, all, there's almost so many. It's like hard to pick. I mean, maybe if I narrow it down, like diet has changed a lot over the 20th century. That that's arguably been the main change. And barring sleep, maybe diet has the most profound effect on someone's health. And it might not be news to your listeners or, or anyone at this point, but over the course of the 20th century, the, the amount of processed food and ultra processed food with we eat and our eating has increased a lot. So it's increased at least double um, from about 20% to 40%, something like that. Uh, and processed food lacks a lot of the nutrients needed to support life and the reproductive function. Uh, and it displaces more healthful whole foods, you know, plant and animal foods. Um, so the general quality of the diet has decreased. And that is also as well contributed or caused a rise in obesity, which does explain a small amount of those trends, but n- not the lion's share. Like, for instance, the, the decline in testosterone might be like 1.4% a year, but if you take into account the increase in body weight, it's only 1% a year. So it explains you know, a bit, but it doesn't explain a lot. It, sorry, it doesn't explain all of it. And then, I mean, there's other things like sleep, like the circadian disruptions, the disruption of the circadian rhythm. So like 100 years ago, probably nobody had light bulbs. Or only a few people had light bulbs. Uh, whereas now everybody has light bulbs. You can stay up, you know, as late as you want. I mean, in regards to testosterone, 
the majority of testosterone is produced when you sleep, uh, along with growth hormone, other anabolic hormones. So if on a kind of civilization-wide scale, you're, you're disrupting that restorative sleep cycle with blue lights and uh, and general kind of haphazard sleep schedules, that's going to disrupt things. So, I mean, those, those, I mean, it's kind of like, how long do you have <laughs> in terms of the causes? Like, you can go on forever, but I suppose those are some of the main ones. I mean, one maybe interesting one that, that people haven't considered is something I've been thinking about doing a paper on. Um, cause it's, it's, as far as I'm aware, nobody's really linked these, uh, at least not, not, not in the academic literature. Often people on the, on the internet <laughs> are there before the academics are. Um, is the increase in vegetable oils. So obviously there's, there's loads of research on the increase in vegetable oils and linoleic acid having adverse effects, and that's omega-3, sorry, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it's the predominant one. So linole linoleic acid has been shown to have ad adverse health effects that are generally linked to oxidative stress, They're highly unsaturated, fat it's more prone to oxidation and that causes damage in the cells but with, in terms of male fertility specifically there's a fair few studies and they show that infertile men are more they have a higher ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the actual sperm so it's showing a very direct effect um, of linoleic acid on sperm and the increase over the 20th century via consuming more foods like margarine, shortening, or vegetable oils, like particularly soybean oil in, it, in the US as well. Like soybean oils, like if you look at the graphs, it's like <laughs> it's like 0.1% of the diet 100 years ago, and then now it's like, I don't know, like 15% or something crazy of people's diets. Um, and that, that's obviously in a lot of processed foods. So I think as, as an understudied area or a lesser known factor, the increase in, um, the increase in vegetable oils and linoleic acid is probably having a lot of adverse effects on male reproductive health and just everybody's health in general. In regards to the second part of your question, what can you do? I mean, following on from that decreased vegetable oil, and like stop eating the processed foods because that's where it's in. Uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people are like drizzling soybean oil on their foods, are they? It's, it's normally in like the, the cakes and the cookies. And then fo focus on it, it, it's all, it's normally easier for people to focus on eating foods rather than explicitly just focusing on excluding everything. Most people don't need to exclude a lot of foods um, if they don't have food intolerances. But so if you're thinking about what, what can you do to support male reproductive health, so sperm and testosterone, the key micronutrients are zinc, uh, vitamin A, vitamin D, um, selenium, magnesium, folate, things like that. And those are, I mean, key foods for that, beef, beef, pork, uh, red meat. I mean, if you're thinking about foods high in zinc, selenium, we talked about carnitine earlier. That is like great. So I'm sure guys will be thrilled to hear that they can have their steaks and burgers because they're 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 probably very good for your overall reproductive health. Vitamin A often a difficult nutrient to get in the modern diet. So with that, you're thinking about eggs, uh, liver. If you can eat liver once a week, that's a great addition to the diet. Then, um, I mean, other foods high in zinc and selenium, shellfish, oysters, mussels, very high. I mean, it's kind of funny because oysters are a natural, sorry, oysters are kind of regarded as an aphrodisiac and they're very high in zinc, which promotes testosterone, and very high in selenium, which promotes sperm health. This, and the antioxidants, generally, I think people should, like, I, I agree with you, what you can get in food, get in food, because... We, are, we know that like, you know, X nutrient does this and X nutrient does that, but what about all the other ones that come with it um, within natural foods that aren't in a supplement that are probably going to have synergistic effects? Maybe in 100 years people will know all of these things. 
um, but for now we don't. So yeah, so it's best to get them in their natural form. Yeah, the antioxidants, so vitamin C, vitamin E, have a, have a lot of important roles for promoting my reproductive health. And then, so if you can kind of get those types of nutrients within your foods, there are a few that you, you um, probably would be wise to supplement if you really want to kind of max out everything. So one, vitamin D, if you don't live in a sunny climate, um, vitamin D is really key for testosterone and sperm health. If you live in a sunny climate, you, you can just get it by the sun. But like for me, I live in the UK, you know, it's cold, it rains all the time. So, <laughs> you know, sunny like a day of the year. So you guys have vitamin D here. The other two, probably co coenzyme Q10, because you can't really get that from food. There's a bit in heart, I think a bit in like olive oil and avocado oil, but you can't really get that in meaningful amounts via the diet. You can take that as a kind of supernatural enhancer. The thing with coenzyme Q10, it's very important, the formulation you get. Some people say, oh, the ubiquinol is better. Um, it's not. It doesn't make a difference. The, the, the standard form of CoQ10 is, is as well, if not better, absorbed than the more expensive ubiquinol. Um, so if you just get plain old CoQ10, but it's the way it's prepared in the capsule, which they can do a lot of different things to increase the absorption. So, I mean, I suppose an easy thing would be like focus on the higher quality brands. So in the US, like Jarrow's, Pure Encapsulations. Whereas in the UK, it's like Pharmanoid. And those are going to have much, much better absorption. And then the last supplement, I'd say, so you've got vitamin D, CoQ10. The last supplement, definitely for sperm health, would be um, uh, NAC and LCT and acetyl cysteine, which is it donates an amino acid cysteine to um, an antioxidant in your body called glutathione, which is like the man master antioxidant, and so it supports your body's endogenous um, antioxidant system, and it's known to improve sperm health. I don't know if it improves testosterone, it may do. The formulation doesn't really matter with that. They're pretty much all the same. So I'd say that those three supplements and then focus on the, uh, the kind of micronutrient-rich foods. Just popping into today's episode to tell you a little bit about the show sponsor, Saturate. One of my top recommendations for women coming off birth control, looking to balance hormones or preparing for pregnancy is finding a way to incorporate liver regularly into the diet. So why liver? Well, liver is one of the most nutrient dense foods available. It's rich in folate, choline, vitamin B12, iron, vitamin A, selenium, zinc, coenzyme Q10, and I could go on, but I'll stop. But unless you grew up eating it, many of my clients have a hard time loving the taste. And that's where Saturate comes in. Saturate A plus liver capsules contain 100% Australian grass fed and finished beef liver, freeze dried and 100% pure. So no fillers, no preservatives or any of that other junk. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash liver today and enter coupon code fertility Friday for a 5% discount off your order. That's fertilityfriday.com slash liver. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Mm -hmm. I feel like you gave us a lot there, a lot to think about. One of the things that I've studied a little is the connection between omega-3 fatty acids and improved sperm health. So it makes a lot of sense what you're saying about the increase in vegetable oils and processed foods, because processed foods, part of the issue is, you know, that it can often really kind of throw off blood sugar depending on what you're eating. But obviously part of it is based on the highly processed, I call them industrial seed oils <laughs> that they put in there and who knows what, you know, um, I did an inter interview with Sally Fallon about her book, what it's called Nourishing Fats. And uh, in the book, she, for, cause for me, I'm not a nutritionist. 
so in her book, she broke down the difference between saturated fats, monosaturated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated, et cetera. And so you really, she really like drives the point home, the difference between the different kinds of fats and how susceptible some of these highly processed fats are to oxidative stress and damage. And then how that can then just kind of mess things up and contribute to inflammation and things like that. Um, so then it's no surprise that a higher intake of like fish and fish eggs or di different foods that are really high in omega-3 fatty acids are, you know, beneficial to sperm. So I'm not sure if you wanted to speak to that a little bit. I feel like you covered, I think it's really interesting as you went into the foods and where these nutrients, these micronutrients that are key for male fertility, male reproductive health, because basically you listed all animal foods. Um, so I want to give you, uh, so, I mean, I have observed, like, if you look at the research and you look at the micronutrients that are required to support optimal sperm health, and you look at the foods that they're found in, I mean, often that's what you're left with. So I'd love to hear you speak to that a little bit because there are, of course, a lot of people following different kinds of diets. I get a lot of questions about, you know, vegetarian, vegan diet, and there are a lot of very popular male influencers who are super ripped and cut who say that they're powered by plants. So did you want to talk a little bit about then just that topic? Yeah, yeah, sure. Dive into the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm no stranger to controversy. I mean, I'm not, uh, it's not like I'm like a carnivore or anything i mean so to be honest i don't everyone thinks they're not biased but i don't think i'm particularly biased one way or the other in this debate but like like yourself you know when you read the literature that's what you find you find that there are essential nutrients in animal foods they're more they're more bioavailable in animal foods and you know these are necessary to support overall health and particularly reproductive health. Reproductive health is almost like the tip of the iceberg. Like you, if you've got everything else sorted in your health, you'll have good, good reproductive health. Vitamin A is a standout one, but the minerals we talked about, um, selenium, zinc. Vitamin D, even even though it's not um, primarily you get it through diet, the only dietary foods that really have it are, are animal foods like liver, oily fish, a little bit of eggs. So, yeah, I mean... Yeah, animal foods, they're almost like essential, I think, for, for a healthy diet. The thing with people who are like the influencers who are on vegan diets and things like that, the thing I think when I say, okay, maybe you can be healthy on a vegan diet or reasonably healthy for like 10 years. It's like after that, I think people's health, I mean, even within that 10 years, people's health is probably going to be declining a lot. And then you think that, oh, that's only one generation or even just not even one generation, only one small aspect, small time frame in someone's life. It's like, you know, what's, what will happen if you're vegetarian your entire life and then your kids are vegetarian for their entire life and then their kids are vegetarian for their entire life? Um, because a lot of these people are starting from a very high baseline. And so they may be able to get away with a suboptimal diet. Whereas if you're, if you don't, if you're not born with such a robust constitution and you try a, a vegan diet, that, that might really kind of derail you. So what, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> um, well, I don't, I, I don't know if I, I was just like listening intently. So, but as you were talking, I think I, I just have, I guess, some follow-ups because again, from my perspective, uh, when I, I use the menstrual cycle as the barometer, and so I always say to my clients, it doesn't matter what I say, it matters what your chart shows. And so a healthy menstrual cycle, you have a good strong follicular phase with good cervical fluid production. I'm not sure how much you are aware about all this stuff. And then, you know, after ovulation, you'd have a strong corpus luteum forming um, that produces significant progesterone throughout the whole the second half of the cycle. And so in a strong cycle, your luteal phase, the second half is about 12 to 14 days. And with that strong progesterone production, you wouldn't have, you know, a bunch of spotting and, uh, you know, a bunch of problems and severe PMS because that high progesterone, good production is actually going to offset any negative effects of the estrogen that you're still producing during that time. So this is a long way of saying that for me, some aspects of my work are kind of simpler because if someone tells me, okay, everything is great, right? I'm eating in a certain way or whatever, then we're going to see that in the cycle. Like it's just very cut and dry. So what I've observed is that it's often harder 
for women to achieve that optimal menstrual cycle health. I'm not, you know, it may not be impossible, but it's often more challenging because from my perspective, from looking at women's menstrual cycle charts, it's often harder to to have that optimal hormone production to give you that strong, robust overall cycle. So from your perspective, then going back to like testosterone production and sperm production and optimal reproductive health, et cetera, why would um, like a vegetarian or vegan diet not be optimal for that, you know, from your perspective? Well, yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to the micronutrients. So the ones we know about, there's probably a load in like animal foods we don't know about. So vitamin A, in general, nutrients are more absorbable from animal foods because in plant foods, there's, there's a lot of different molecules that can inhibit, particularly the absorption of minerals like phy- So the inhibitors are like phytic acid or enzyme inhibitors that, that inhibit the absorption of minerals that are, that are key for these reproductive functions. Yeah, so I mean, basically, I probably already said it. It's it's the micronutrients essentially that there's more of them in animal foods. They're more bio bioavailable to get the full spectrum of all those micronutrients needs for reproductive health. You have to consume animal foods, and preferably as well. I mean, I know there's some carnivores and stuff that like just live off steak, but I think like the whole spectrum of animal foods provides a lot of different nutrients. So, you know, like for instance. Uh, fish eggs or or roe provides a highly bioavailable source of omega-3 fatty acids. So they're in a a more absorbable form. Whereas then you go to things like liver, it's high in vitamin A. You go to things like beef, it's high in selenium. Um, You go into things like eggs, high in uh, choline and vitamin A. So like generally like vegan, you know, you're not going to be getting a lot of those. I mean, when I remember when I studied, there were a fair few women that were vegans or were past vegans, and a lot of them had come down with like uh, anemia or like quite severe health problems because of it. So you know you, you can see it. Um, I mean, I have a girlfriend who are vegans and stuff, and you know to the trained eye, it's like <laughs> you can see the deficiencies. You're talking about sperm health in particular, vitamin C, which is of course. It is in animal foods, but not really too much. It's obviously way, way higher in plant foods. There, there's quite a lot of literature showing that that's really good for sperm. I, th- I think for optimal health, there are that that has good outcomes for uh, increased in increasing uh, sperm health. And interestingly, with that, because I mean, it's the oh raw foods. Raw foods are always better. Whereas the interesting thing with lycopene is cooked. A tomato is the more absorbable that for the most absorbable way is um is probably like a tomato sauce where it's like all mashed up um it makes it very highly bioavailable and taken it with a source of fat so yeah i mean you need for for max fertility you probably need the the foods from both from both um kingdoms the animal and plant kingdom and just i'd say one last thing when we were talking about calories right at the start I think low carb diets, I mean, I think they're great. I think probably for max fertility, you need carbs, like for um, at least some level of carbs. It, it's similar to like athletic performance. The research on athletic performance shows that best athletic performance is with at least some carbs. So these kind of higher, higher physiological functions like athletic performance and, and reproductive health. I think you can you can max out them have, having some carbs in there rather than doing a keto or whatever. Well, and is that because if you cut out all the carbs, it's easier to under eat? You know, my understanding is if you try to go really low carb, you have to eat a lot of fat. And I feel like the average person just isn't, you know, it's just you, you might end up accidentally under eating. But I'm not sure what your perspective is on that. Yeah. Well, I mean that that's one of the reasons why the low carb diets work, because <laughs> it because that they, they, they're naturally suited to under eating or calorie restriction. I think with the with the carbs, it's like ketogenic diets. They generally signal to the body that uh, like it's winter and there's not a lot of food. Whereas in times of plenty, like you're thinking of summer, there's lots of fruit around, lots of carbs. That signals to the, to the body, 
you know, there is an abundance of food here. If you have babies, there's going to be plenty for the babies. There's going to be plenty for the mom to support the healthy pregnancy. So, you know, it's going to send a lot of kind of molecular signals eating carbs that, that are going to switch on all the genes that promote fertility and reproductive health. Um, whereas if you restrict them completely, maybe they might switch on genes that might make you live longer, but that's not necessarily going to support reproductive health in the short term. It's the kind of feast and famine thing, and I think carbs send the signal for the feast, um, whereas kind of low-carb diets and ketogenic diets send the signal for the famine, and they both have their purpose. But if you want to max fertility, as long as you're not overweight, I'd say you don't need to skimp on the carbs. Uh, and probably not skim on the calories as well. That's really interesting. It it leads me to, so I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So often what I find myself saying with fertility clients is uh, particularly with regards to this, the question of vegetarian vegan diets, because I get a lot of questions um, and even requests for women to say, oh, you don't really talk about vegetarian vegan diets. You know, I'd love to hear an expert talk about how to optimize that for fertility. <laughs> And what I often say, uh, and it's controversial and, you know, every, everyone certainly doesn't like my answer, but there's a lot of individuals out there who do talk about the benefits of a vegetarian or vegan diet. It's like a healing diet for illness and, you know, cancer and things like that. What I often say is that when you're trying to have babies, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to eat the same way as someone who's trying to avoid a certain type of illness. There's different seasons in life. And so there may, there may be seasons where certain diets are more appropriate. What I found, and again, looking at the menstrual cycle as the barometer or the barometer is that, you know, from my perspective and what the research tells us is that, you know, when you're trying to make babies, when you're trying to make little human beings, you're in a different season. So I'd love to hear your stance on that because you kind of alluded to it when you were talking about the difference between the fast, the feast and famine. Yeah. Just going back a step on the, on the, you, you can look in the science or, or just look at people in every day. And yeah, I mean, you can't deny some people do experience benefits on, on vegetarian and vegan diets. One reason for that is that, you know, they're going from standard American diet to something that, that's including a lot more whole foods. So they're going to get a lot more nutrients. You know, another thing is like they may be cutting out foods they're intolerant to, like dairy or gluten, major ones. Um, so those are the kind of things I think of in terms of explaining the benefits of vegetarian and vegan diets. And maybe this is going out on a limb a lot, but maybe avoiding animal protein may switch on some longevity genes. I'm not sure. I mean, to be honest, I don't really believe that, but at least that's an argument that proponents of those diets make. Yeah, I mean, in the terms of the feast and famine cycle, if you want to extend like longevity and live for as long as possible, like, you want to eat like not a lot <laughs> at least that's what the animal data shows and probably like some kind of low carb or ketogenic style diet and sorry can i interject so it sounds yeah. like you're so i'm not i haven't dove like down the rabbit hole of the research regarding um like fasting and longevity but that seems to be what you're referring to because there is a lot of research suggesting that fasting is associated with living longer yeah definitely yeah yeah, that's a good point. That's one I missed out. So it's like low-carb, ketogenic-style diets, fasting, or calorie restriction, or combining all of them. Those are the types of things that, that are going to make you live longer and have a reduced risk of most of the major diseases. But that is going to, like, if you do them like and or combine them, that's going to send signals to the body on the molecular level to to essentially hibernate, like hibernate until better days. And that's why that's why scientists think it extends lifespan because the body is waiting for better days so it can reproduce later. So it's trying to extend its lifespan um, in the hope that more food and more calories and more carbs will come later and then it can reproduce because, you know, every cell and you know in our body, sorry, every all our genes are geared just, to reproduce essentially, uh, maybe some survival aspects as well. So if you're talking about fertility, you want to probably avoid those types of approaches. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like super familiar with the literature on this, but I would imagine in, in terms of testosterone, I can speak to testosterone. If you want to max out your testosterone, um, you're going to want carbs 
and you're going to want plenty of calories and you're probably not going to want to do extreme fasting, maybe some fasting, but not extreme fasting uh, because those are all the things that are going to signal to your body it's times of plenty and it's going to boost up all those kind of anabolic hormones. Uh, I mean, and for sperm quality, I imagine it, it's fairly similar. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's definitely different diets for different purposes. I mean, it's like kind of like if, if you're trying to build muscle, you're not going to do fasting and calorie restriction, things like that. You're going to do all the stuff that like we just talked about that promotes fertility. Yeah, so so there's there's different ways you can play around with it, you know, depending on your goals. I mean, I will say as well, if you do go the extreme longevity stuff, generally doesn't make people feel that great. Um, so it's often not sustainable, especially the calorie restriction. Because there's two ways you can look at health. You can either look at, like, I just want to go for as long as possible. Like, I just want to be, like, 150 years old. I don't care if I feel like an old man for, like, <laughs> you know, 149 of those years. Um, or you can think of, I just want to, like, have a decent lifespan, whatever, to, like, 80 years, and I want to feel great for the whole thing. So those are the kind of two kind of contrasting ways. So if you want to live to like 150 years, maybe you're going to eat like an apple a day or something. Um, whereas if you want to, if you want to feel good and have a healthy long lifespan, you know, it's more of the kind of things that are more going to align with boosting your fertility, like improving your testosterone and uh, sperm health. Yeah, I think that that is it's it's interesting because we're, we're all kind of searching, it seems right. We're searching for the perfect diet and all this kind of this idea. And I think a lot of people just want that easy answer. We just want to, you know, tell me how to eat. What's the best quote diet, right. For all the things. And then I just want to know that so that I can just follow that forever. I mean, it would be so easy if like life was like that, but it's obviously not. So, you know, when I talk about this with clients, I often say, well, when you have a baby, a baby's diet is very different, even than a toddler and a young child and a young child who's growing, who's, you know, doubling their entire body size in a certain number of years is going to be eating differently than an adult or potentially should be. And then when you're in the reproductive phase, so you won't be in this phase forever. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, eat this exact way forever, uh, depending on what your goals are and your health and all of that. But I do think that what we're talking about today lends itself to at least this idea that when you're in that window of reproductive, like fertility, making babies, both men and women uh, should be thinking about how to improve their overall fertility. And that can be a very, very different approach than when you're older, when you're in your fifties and you're looking to reduce the risk of a variety of health-related, age-related issues and, and longevity. Like, so if there's anything the listeners take away from that, I hope it's that just concept that our the reproductive phase, it's a season, it doesn't last forever, but we should probably be prioritizing different things during that period of time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is definitely a point that's um, underappreciated. And probably a lot of these mechanisms are embodied, embedded in the body for some of the reasons we talked about, but also seasonality. So during the course of a year, our ancestors would have experience times of scarcity and times of abundance and those would have coincided with the uh, likely times women were like, likely to conceive and and men were likely to um, be able to fertilize an egg so i mean you know maybe as a more kind of pragmatic approach you could think i might eat seasonally as an ordinary person but then in times where you're specifically dealing with one issue or the other, whether it be fertility or disease, then you kind of want to maximize the types of approaches that are going to support that, that, that we've already mentioned. You know, so fertility, you want kind of like more, 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 and then disease, you want less, less, less. Um, within the bounds of of things that are kind of evolutionary consistent, because uh, you, uh, you could say, well, more, more, more is just like more, more, more Twinkies or something. <laughs> But um, of course, of course, we know that's not going to be good for your health or, or, or fertility. Well, I, I know I could totally talk to you like all day. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> Just going back to the controversial kind of vegetarian, vegan conversation that we were having. One of the questions that I wanted to ask is, is so we, we hashed it. So, you know, the listeners could 
reverse back a couple minutes if they want. But kind of going back to that idea that, okay, animal foods contain these nutrients. We need to eat animal foods. Of course, uh, someone who does not eat animal foods is going to say, well, no, I can supplement. We know as experienced vegetarians and vegans, what's missing. And we like, what are you telling me? I can't just supplement. So just t- talk to us from your perspective as a nutritionist, because there's certain, there's definitely something to be said for that argument for certain nutrients. Obviously we do have supplements and you can buy them and you can do that. So share with us kind of like the pros and cons and, and just your general thoughts about that. Like, can't we just supplement? I mean, if somebody's like, just like do or die vegetarian or vegan, then, and that they, they'll never eat meat or any animal foods. I mean, of course, taking a supplement to f- fill in those gaps is going to be better than not doing it. Um, like if someone's anemic and they're on a vegan diet, you know, giving them an iron supplement is going to profoundly increase their health. So, yeah, I mean, you can supplement, but I mean, it's kind of like, one, it's like how many supplements you want to take. Like if you add up all these nutrients, you can have like a cupboard full of supplements. And then if, the big thing is, there's so, even if you go back like just like 50 years, we know so much more today than we do, you know, in like 1970. So in another 50 years, we might have discovered all these other nutrients that are in animal foods, because that's kind of what like, at least science is indicating. And it's like, well, are you going to supplement all of those? And then, you know, maybe there's stuff like, there's crazy fields, like they study stuff like quantum biology and stuff. So it's like you don't know all of these effects and you can't supplement for all of them. So, I mean, your safest bet is to get the foods in their natural form or get the nutrients in their natural form, which are found in the whole foods. I mean, I've got a lot of experience with supplementing. I probably took like, I don't know, hundreds of different supplements. I mean, I've got a cupboard full of old supplements I don't take anymore. And I used to supplement loads, like get this nutrient from there and that nutrient from there. And uh, when I, I progressively kind of like scaled back on them, and I, I think at one point I was probably taking like 40 or something. And um, as I scaled back, I felt a lot better. And that really kind of sold me on more, more than anything else on um, getting the food, getting the nutrients from food. I mean, supplements are definitely useful. I'd say for the gen. For the kind of average person, like they might just want to take vitamin D, maybe if they've got a poor diet or multivitamin. Other than that, you probably want to be I either kind of have a very keen interest in it or, or working with someone more experienced. Cause um again, like past experience, you can <laughs> you can you can do some damage with these supplements. Uh, cause it, often these supplements they'll take a nutrient out like resveratrol or something and they'll give it to you in a dose that you would ever get in foods like for for instance one resveratrol pill that's equivalent to 250 bottles of wine and red wine is the highest source of resveratrol so you know these supplements at at the levels you know just within the average health food store they're at pharmaceutical style levels where they're having they're not having a, a, a nutritional effect at that point. It's more like a drug effect. So yeah, you, you do need to be careful. Um, I mean, I'm infertility as well. I mean, it, you're probably best off, um, better safe than sorry, basically, <laughs> and, unless you're working with someone who's got experience with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is, and I mean, many people may have experienced this in their own life. I know I, I did. I, in my, so I grew up, I'm a West Indian girl. I grew up eating liver. So I never had an issue eating it, but I didn't know that it was so good for me. I just, so I didn't have an aversion, but in my twenties, like I, you know, left my house and went to school and did all the things and I wasn't eating liver. And so I developed this iron deficiency, but at the time I didn't know what I know now. And so the doctors were like, Oh, just take iron. (laughs) And I spent like a long time taking iron, which isn't, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I can say is that like from my, like, this is just me, I'm an N of one. So this is not scientific. So when I took the iron, I took it every day for years and my actual blood levels, they were, they, they kind of were high enough not to be deficient, but they stayed there. So they were never really great. They were always low, but high enough to not be quote deficient and yeah, eating liver, um, on the other hand, yeah, the, like the blood levels are a completely different situation. So that's just 
kind of just a little snippet of my personal experience. And I've had many clients have a similar experience where um, a lot of their levels normalize if they're able to incorporate some liver or something like that. So that's just to kind of put it out there that it sounds like what you're saying is we can try to get rid of some of the, like uh, fill in some of the gaps and the holes and things like that. And that can really help, but it's not necessarily optimal depending on what your goals are. And it may not be, it may not be a sustainable long-term strategy depending on the situation. That's kind of what I took from, from what you said. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Well, so, you know, as we bring everything to a close, I feel like we covered so much today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to share your knowledge and wisdom with us in this area. This conversation was just fascinating. And I always like focusing on men sometimes because as women, we're always, often I find the women are already doing all the things. And um, one of the things I always say is there's no man alive. So you can tell me if I'm wrong, but in my personal opinion, there's no man alive that's so healthy that when it's time to conceive, he just doesn't have to do anything. I always say like, there's no man alive that's so healthy. He couldn't even benefit from a multivitamin. So maybe from this conversation, it's like couldn't benefit from a little bit of liver every now and then. But if you have any last thoughts or comments that you'd like to share with the listeners, especially those who tuned into this episode because maybe their partner, um, their sperm parameters aren't where they'd like to be, or they have some concerns potentially about their partner's fertility, what, if anything, would you want them to to know? Uh, I mean, I can give it like a little rundown. I mean, for, for guys, it's like, why not max it out? Like, why not max out your nutrition? You're going to feel a lot better. You're going to probably perform better in bed, so... <laughs> you know that's going to be a bit of a bonus for you like start with the basics so if you're smoking if you're drinking too much if you're smoking cannabis those all need to go i mean alcohol doesn't need to go completely um but definitely limit it then like exercise you know moderate amount of exercise not too much not too little get your sleep in check those are probably the big ones and then when you go into nutrition if you're overweight you lose weight that's going to have a major impact if you're at a normal weight, just make sure you're eating enough. Uh, and if you're underweight, you might want to consider eating more, uh, particularly in con- conjunction with like resistance training. And then the final aspect, maybe one of the most powerful, is focusing on the foods that are going to support fertility. So we, we talked about this, um, a lot of the animal foods. So it's just some of the key ones like liver, eggs, red meat in general, oily fish, shellfish. And then when you go to the plant kingdom, you want um, foods high in vitamin C. So there's lots, but some of them are like bell peppers, tomatoes, some of the highest. Lycopene seems to support male health. So main source is tomatoes for that. And then vitamin E as well. So avocados, olive oil, uh, things of that nature. So, yeah, that I mean, that's kind of like a kind of cliff notes on <laughs> how to max out your male fertility. Awesome. That was, yeah, I'm really thrilled just at everything we covered today. Yeah. Oh, so I was just going to ask you if you would like to share where the audience can go to learn more about you. So your website, if you have social media handles, I'd be happy to link your research paper or if if I can get the full text, I'd be happy to link that for the audience who, uh, members who want to dive into it because I know a lot of practitioners also listen to the show. Uh, so let us know all the places. Yeah. I mean, the website, joewitzkinnutrition.com. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the full text. You can't share it publicly, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, because I'll it's share the in- link so everyone will be able to see the abstract. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that'll be great. In terms of, I do have another paper coming out. I might as well take the opportunity to promote it. It's in this area, so it's on low-carb diets and testosterone and cortisol, which reasonably, they they correspond well to male facility. That's coming out in a couple of months, so um, that's one to look out for. But, I mean, I've had a great time talking to you. Uh, it's been really fun. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 385. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. It was just so interesting to hear a specific, a different perspective, but a specific nutritional kind of zoning in on men's health and sperm production and testosterone and how diet plays a role And ironically, in the work that I do, it often goes back to an ancestral approach. 
essentially when tracking menstrual cycle health and things like that from the female perspective, you really just have to do what works. You have to do what works to improve overall hormone production, improve those menstrual parameters, keep the cycle within a normal range, improve the cervical fluid production, improve the progesterone production, and, you know, strengthen the luteal phase length and all of these specific factors, you know, improve the length and quality of period, the period and et cetera, et cetera. And so ultimately you have to do what works when you're tracking a real time, when you're tracking a real time vital sign, you do end up having to do what works to actually improve those parameters. And so, you know, it's so interesting to, to really learn about the male side of it with respect to testosterone and sperm production and how it relates to diet food, how what's often best for optimal sperm and testosterone production differs from a lot of the nutritional advice that we tend to, to receive these days. And again, it's really about what works, what is actually going to improve those levels, what is actually going to improve the overall quality of sperm. It's certainly time for men to take notice of what's happening, these trends that are happening. One of the things I often share with my clients when we talk about sperm quality is that it's not just about your partner. This isn't like an individual issue because it's across the board and it's affecting all men. And there's so many reasons why overall, you know, men's sperm counts are declining and the quality and quantity of sperm in the average man is significantly lower than it was even 50 years ago. And there's some dim prospects if we keep going in that direction. So there's really a lot to be said. So I'm really glad that I was able to have Joe on the show and that we were able to have a conversation about this. And if there's a man in your life who you feel could benefit from tuning into today's episode, then you know you can use the link fertilityfriday.com slash 385 to share. And in the show notes page, I'll make sure to link some of the previous episodes that have focused specifically on men's health. So including the episode that I released recently with Dr. Thinus Kruger, who talks specifically about sperm quality and the sperm test, the difference between the strict morphology and the other types of tests, as well as my recent episode, semi-recent, uh, with Mark Sklar, where we really talked about the normal sperm parameters for men and why the results that you see on the lab or why the pr- parameters on those lab forms are different to what we would consider optimal. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week weekend whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.